So you finally made a decision to buy your first telescope. But which one? There's so many out there. There's different shapes, sizes, colors, makes. Well, after watching this video, hopefully I'm going to make that decision that little bit easier for you. Hello, welcome to my channel, Small Optics. My name is Jason. Now, this is a bit of a follow-up from a video I uploaded a couple of weeks ago on getting started in the hobby of astronomy. Uh, now, I'll leave a link to that video, by the way, in the description, if you're interested in watching that. And in that video, we talked a little bit about uh, the things that you should be doing to prepare yourself up to actually buying a telescope. Now, when the question of what telescope should I buy crops up. It's never an easy uh, question to answer. There's never a straight answer really. And uh, it's often said that um, when that question is asked, you know, what telescope should I buy? It's a little bit like saying, or somebody asking you, what car should I buy? Okay, and if you think about it, you know, well, what do you want your car for? You know, there's a lot of questions you take into consideration. Do you want it off-road for off-roading? Do you want a sporty? Do you want it for to do the school run? Whatever, you see what I'm saying. Um, and telescopes are a little bit like that. So what I'm gonna do is hopefully keep this nice and simple, uh, straight to the point, just so you, you, you know, you get a better understanding of what you're actually getting yourself in for, if you like. So let's start off by just I mean, a little quick talk about the uh, different types of telescope that's on offer, okay? Now, teles telescopes fall under two categories, refractors and reflectors, okay? Now, this is a refractor telescope. It simply means it, uh, it, the light comes in through the uh, front of the telescope through a lens, and this is how it manipulates the light, if you like. It brings the light to a focal point, which then comes to the eyepiece at the end, okay? And you just uh, put an eyepiece in there. Remember, an eyepiece is separate to the telescope, all right? So you need the eyepiece to see the image. Uh, the eyepiece goes in there and you uh, focus it and that's how you see it, okay? And that's how a refractor telescope works. Uh, and it's the common one, you know, you, it's the long skinny one. They're usually a lot longer than this. This is just a short tube, what they call a short tube refractor. Um, but we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, the other type of telescope is a reflecting type of telescope, one like this, okay? Now, instead of lenses uh, to... Um, uh, re refract the light, it doesn't refract the light, it reflects the light this time, okay? So light comes in, I don't know if you can see, in there there's a, uh, a mirror at the bottom there. Um, I don't know if you can see, if the camera's picking that up, I haven't got a monitor see, so I can't see what you can see. Uh, so light comes in there, and what it does is it, it comes down the tube and it bounces off a, a concave mirror here, which bounces back up the tube onto a secondary flat mirror, which is uh, on the end of this circle here. There's like, it's just inside here. And then that reflects the light back up through the tube here. Okay, and that's how a reflector telescope works. Now, there is another type of reflector telescope out there. Um, this one is, is called a Cassegrain telescope. Well, there's three types of this telescope, really. There's a, a Cassegrain, a, a Smith Cassegrain, and what's called a Maksutov Cassegrain uh, telescope, or Mac for short. Now, these are pretty much all the same, okay? They're just slightly arranged different. The optics are slightly uh, arranged sli a little bit different in each uh, particular model. Uh, now, the way these are quite clever, actually, how these work. Now, light, instead of, same as a reflector, the light comes in, okay, hits a concave mirror at the back, but instead of hitting a flat mirror this time, it hits a convexed mirror, which uh, manipulates the light even, again, which bounces it back down through a hole in the primary mirror. That's the big mirror at the bottom here. There's actually a hole in there. And the eyepiece would be here like on uh, a refracting type telescope, okay? So they're the, uh, they're the main telescopes that you will see uh, that are common to buy today. Now, remember, I know there's different types of telescope, but at the end of the day, they all do the same thing, okay? They're gonna bring space 
closer <laughs> okay if you like but of course they all have the pros and cons all right so let's just start with the refractor now this is a good starting well i've seen a good starting telescope a lot of people start with a refracting telescope okay they're the most common type of telescope the thing i like about refractors is they're good to go straight out of the box okay you've got no faffing about to do as soon as that parcel arrives you unpack it you've set it up you take it outside and you start enjoying the night sky okay um they're um the downside to refractors is they can get very expensive okay uh considerably more expensive um inch for inch of aperture more than a uh, reflecting type telescope now i'm gonna we'll cover aperture in in a short while because that's very important point of a telescope actually but like i said they can get pricer but for something this size like a, a 70 millimeter refractor a short tube telescope like this various um manufacturers do them celestron do one sky watch you do one okay and i think one's called a star travel something like that these are little travel scopes and to be honest they're great little scopes and they are gonna see uh, show you quite a few nice things up in the night sky okay so that's a refractor telescope the only other thing that people say about refractors is they suffer from a thing called chromatic aberration all right now this simply means false color okay now as a beginner this is totally unimportant all right and to be honest um, as a seasoned astronomer myself it's unimportant to me now all right because optics these days are good enough to the, the the chromatic aberration or the false color is so little to a beginner they're never ever gonna notice it okay or you're not never gonna notice it um the only time it will ever be a problem is if you want to do any kind of serious astrophotography okay and in astrophotography you know um they can get very touchy about chromatic aberration okay uh, but like i say it's not really a problem in refractors because you can hardly notice it unless somebody points it out to you. Now, reflectors on the other hand, unlike reflect, uh, refractors, these one, one of the bonus things about these are you get a lot of bang for your buck, okay? Um, that's, that's one thing that you'll always say. And what I mean by this is it's a big misconception about the power of a telescope, okay? Um, what's most important when you're going to buy your first telescope is the aperture okay look at if it says if it starts saying things about power ignore that and it shouldn't be saying things about power because usually what they are is on these very very cheap telescopes that you can find called department store telescopes let's say okay now they're commonly known in the astronomy uh, community as hobby killers because trust me these cheap 50 millimeter and below aperture telescopes are, are absolutely a waste of time trust me you're not going to see anything through them all right so you're far better off just spending that little bit of money on uh, a 70 mil something like that something like a short tube start with if you fancy a refractor at the end of this video if that's the telescope that sounds for you something like this is uh, is going to do you for a short period of time okay we'll we'll go through exactly what each telescope will show you uh, in a short while but just remember power is not important aperture is important so if we go back to what i was saying about refractors get expensive okay uh the 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 uh, bigger they get or wider they get should we say and that's purely because of the glass and a lens is a lot harder to make than a mirror okay so there's a lot more labor goes into making a lens so blah -de blah -de blah you can see why that soon mounts up but going back to the reflectors the aperture you can get a good size aperture for a reasonable price okay now why is aperture so important then you know all this uh uh, talk about light well it, it's it's exactly that um well let's just take 
the dust covers off here okay we've got a dust cover here and if we look at the size of this dust cover here all right now if i was to if it was throwing it down with rain outside which it usually is in the uk <laughs> we 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 place both dust covers on the ground like that okay and we time 10 minutes say okay this is just a rough experiment we take both dust covers back back inside and we pour both uh, what they've collected of water into measuring drug jugs okay now obviously this one will have collected more water than this one now imagine those raindrops as photons of light okay the more photons of light the more light the telescope can collect the brighter the image is going to be now it's a dark place up there and that's something you're going to quickly find out that when you first look at the night sky through a telescope it's going to look very dark okay and it's going to take you a while to get used to it uh, so this is why the, the, the more aperture you can uh, afford, the better, basically. Now, again, unlike uh, a refracting telescope, because these use mirrors, you don't get none of this false colour, okay, that you can sometimes get in refractor telescopes. Um, the, but what you can get is something that's called comirin, okay. Now, again, something you haven't got to worry about as a beginner, all right. I, you have to look for it to notice it. The only time you're ever going to worry about things like coma and chromatic aberration, false colour, like I say, is if you're doing any kind of astro, serious astrophotography, okay? So um, you, you're just not going to notice it, so don't worry about that one. Okay, that's a few good points about a reflecting telescope. So what are the bad points? Well, the most obvious one is yes they do need collimating now what's collimation this is simply um something you have to do to the primary mirror all right and it's just simply adjusting the primary mirror so it's in line with the secondary mirror okay admittedly there's a little bit of an art to it there's a little bit of a technique to it but it's not difficult okay it'll take you a, a couple of attempts watch it there's, there's a plethora of youtube videos out there on how to collimate i've done a video on uh, collimation a nice easy method without no lasers so I'll, I'll leave a link to that one in the description if you want to take a look at that but like i say collimation yes they do need collimation not as often as you may think all right now if you're not taking your telescope too far if it's just going from uh, inside your house to the back door say very little as long as you're gentle with it if you're going to be taking your telescope in a car over bumpy roads to a darker location something like that then yes it's going to probably need a little tweak once you get onto location but like i say once you learn the technique of collimation it's not difficult so certainly don't let that put you off all right um, but if it does like i say refractors don't need any of that they're straight out of the box because that's another thing don't expect that your telescope when you buy one uh, a reflector telescope that it is going to be collimated all right remember if especially if it's been mail order it's it's been traveled all right so uh, these things do come out of alignment every now and then so what about the uh, Cassegrain or the Max Sutoff uh, type of telescopes well the great thing about these is you may be wondering why they had, I showed you the strange uh, mirror arrangement or optical arrangement at the start of the video. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, the reason they do this, it's all to do with something called focal length, okay? Now, um, this is not really anything to do with the aperture, okay? Um, this is to do with how long, the, if the telescopes, the longer the telescope, the more powerful each eyepiece will be that you use. I think that's an easy way of explaining it. Okay, so in other words, if I use a 10 millimeter, uh, tele uh, a 10 millimeter eyepiece in this eyepiece, okay, in this telescope, sorry, not in this eyepiece, in this telescope, okay, I took the same uh, 10 millimeter eyepiece out and put it into this telescope. If you notice, this telescope's a lot longer. This will simply mean that the same eyepiece will magnify a lot more in this telescope than it will in this one, okay? Um, that kind of just simplifies it. 
So if we go back to looking at the diagram of these Cassegrain telescopes, instead of light just coming down one path like on a refractor or on two paths like a, re uh, a reflector, you can see that it comes down, it hits that uh, primary, bounces back up to the secondary and then back again down. Now that path of light, if you imagine that like a carpenter's ruler, okay, and you were to unfold all that light, you've got a telescope like this kind of long, all right, a really long telescope. Um, so what this does, this uh, configuration of uh, mirrors, is it really makes them nice and compact, all right? So this is great for storage. Now, because they use mirrors, they are going to need collimating, all right? Like a reflector telescope. So they're not quite as grab and go as a refractor, okay? So they don't need collimating as often as a reflector. I'll stick a limb out and say that, okay? But they do need a little bit of maintenance. The other thing that uh, these type of uh, telescopes uh, can suffer from, uh, especially the Smith Cassegrain and the Max Sutoff type, they have like what's called a corrector plate or a refraction uh, glass at the front. This is known to dew up, all right? This is an easy fix. You just simply, um, you make yourself a dew shield if you like. Um, as you can see, a separate dew shield that fits over the telescope. This will prevent them from dewing up. Now, I want to go back to uh, aperture again now, because this is important. Now, there is a minimum practical aperture you want to be looking at when you're buying a telescope, okay? Now, for refractors, ideally, you don't want anything less than 76 millimeters, okay? Now that's the objective lens at the front, okay? This is the main uh, lens. I don't know if I can spin that around. There's, that means this here, okay? A minimum of 70 millimeters or 76 millimeters, which is roughly three inch, okay? Um, ideally bigger, but like I say, refractors, as soon as you start adding uh, millimeters onto the aperture of these things, they get expensive, all right? So just be aware of that. Um, on a reflector type telescope, the minimum practical, it's, it's hard these days because optics are so much better than they used to be. Um, but I'm gonna, I'm, again, I'm gonna stick my neck out and say 114 millimeters is your minimum for a reflector telescope. That's round about four, four and a half inches. Okay, this is 130 millimeters. All right, this is uh, uh, just over five inches of aperture. For Cassegrain type telescopes, I would say the minimum aperture for those is 90 millimeters okay uh, for it to be any kind of uh, practical uh, a practical telescope you can get them smaller i do believe there's one on the market at the minute that's around about 60 millimeters i have heard good things about it not personally looked through one so i couldn't tell you that for sure but as a general rule round about the 90 millimeters for cassegrain is going to be a good practical size so with these minimum apertures what are the kind of things you're going to be able to see well let's for instance a telescope as small as this can you see the craters on the moon yes all right quite well in fact very well can you see, let's say, the rings of Saturn? Yeah, you can. Can you see some detail on Jupiter? Absolutely, all right? Um, with, and that's with a small telescope like this. So obviously, yes, you can. To all the questions I've uh, just said there, you, you can see even better in this telescope, okay? Because the image is gonna be that bit brighter, all right? Purely because, what, like what we said, it's got more aperture than this one. So it just goes to show you, you don't need a huge, great telescope to see amazing things in the night sky. Now, one thing to always remember, no matter what telescope you do buy, and if you've never looked through a telescope, an astronomical type telescope before, and the first time you look at anything, like such as, the, especially the planets, you're gonna realize how small they look. 
Okay, now don't worry. This is how planets look. They're a long, long way away, okay? Even in great huge telescopes, they still look small, all right? So don't be worried about uh, how, how small they look. But like I say, a telescope as small as this is going to show you the rings of Saturn, all right? So um, just bear in, that mind, bear in mind that you don't have to spend a small fortune on a telescope uh, to see some pretty spectacular things. Now, I just quickly want to talk about the mounts that telescopes uh, come on. Uh, as you can see, the mount that this one's on completely different to the one that this one's on. Okay, now, this one's called an equatorial mount, all right? Uh, the way that it's done like this is it just simply is it's easier to track uh, any object in the night sky, okay? With these, it's not quite as easy, but you know, it's not really a problem. You track it, this is just like a camera mount, if you like, it goes left, right, up, down, all right? As where this one, uh, if I show you how this one moves, this one moves in more of an arc, all right? Uh, and that, that's how that went. And this is how the stars appear to move across the night sky. The other type of mount, I haven't got one here, Andy, at the minute to show you, is uh, called an Altaz mount. Now, if you've used a camera tripod, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Again, that's just up, down, left, right. Um, uh, some telescopes come, uh, a lot of entry-level telescopes come with this particular type of mount. Now, if I was going to say advise a mount to get, straight away I would go for, I'd say Dobsonian. This is called a Dobsonian type of mount, all right? And it's just by uh, a fella called John Dobson who invented it, and that's why we call it the Dobsonian mount. But obviously, you need one of these type of telescopes for a Dobsonian mount. The reason why I wouldn't recommend an equatorial mount for a beginner, even though they're not difficult to use, there is still a little bit of an art form to them. There's still a little bit of a technique. They take a little bit of getting used to. Okay, so you may struggle if you've never ever used a telescope before. Don't think that you've got to have one of these fancy mounts, okay, to do any kind of serious astronomy, because you don't, all right? Um, like I say, when, when you get into the hobby a little bit more, uh, you may, f you, you will find that these are very, very useful, okay? They, de they definitely have the place. Now, another type of uh, arrangement you might come across when looking for, uh, when you're buying your first telescope is a mount that's called a go-to mount. Um, now, there's a few little, now these are great, don't get me wrong, they're, they're an amazing bit of technology, but there's a few things I want to take you, you to take into consideration as a beginner if you uh, fancy buying one of these. The first bit of my advice is don't. <laughs> okay, um, I would ban them for all beginners until they've had at least 12 months of experience. No, no, two years of experience under the night sky. Now, I'm not trying to be some like strict headmaster by saying a, a, something like that or try to be mean or anything. It's just simply um, you're still going to need a little bit of knowledge, all right, to get the thing going to get the thing, don't think for one minute, you can take them out of the box, go press a button and it's gonna show you amazing sights. They still need a bit of setting up, all right? So you're still gonna need a basic bit of knowledge. But one of the main reasons I don't like them for beginners is they take away a lot of the magic of first hunting down and finding objects uh, for the first time yourself. Okay, especially when you start looking for some of the fainter objects, some of the Messier targets, uh, things like that. Um, and it could take you a couple of nights sometimes, all right, before you actually find it. And when you do find it, trust me, the feeling is so rewarding. You just want to shout and tell the world. Well, I don't care what anybody says. No go-to telescope is ever going to give you that that experience. So you really are going to be missing out. Um, the kind of make you run before you can walk, as far as I'm concerned. They give you all your cake at once, <laughs> okay? Um, and you'll find that you're not going to appreciate 
the night sky as much as a total beginner you know if you buy a go-to as, as your first telescope you're just not going to appreciate the night sky as much uh, purely because the go-to is going to go around it's going to show you a target you're going to look in and go oh that's great next one Oof. Oh, next one, boof. You're not gonna spend any time at all at the eyepiece appreciating it, okay? Uh, the other thing to be aware of with the go-to telescopes is they're often sold on telescopes this size, okay? And smaller, uh, and even this size, all right? And bigger, okay? But it's the ones on the smaller type entry-level telescopes that go-tos are fitted. Now, they come with a handheld controller now, on that database, it'll tell you that there's literally thousands and thousands of targets that this thing will find. Well, the computer may be well find it for you, but the telescope is not going to show it you. All right. Um, you've got to remember a small aperture telescope like this is going to show you a lot of amazing things but it's going to show you a tiny fraction of that database that's in these go-to telescopes okay so it's just something to bear in mind if you're thinking about buying one of these go-to uh, telescopes so what about these little tabletop telescopes that are around these days are they any good well this is why I kind of hesitated when I was talking about minimum size aperture because optics are so good now uh, you can actually buy these little 76 millimeter telescopes now uh, which are actually a three inch mirror reflecting telescope. Now if 20 years ago somebody says oh I've got a three inch reflector I'd have probably had a little chuckle to myself and think well what good is that you know that's absolutely useless not because I'm an equipment snob or anything like that it's just that I know that uh, back then a three inch ref reflector would have been pretty useless well I was totally blown away the first time I looked through one of these uh, little tabletop reflectors because they are actually pretty damn good now Again, they are not going to show you much. In fact, they're pretty much limited to the moon and planets, okay? I mean, forget deep sky or anything like that with them. Uh, but as a rule, as, a, as a, an actual first telescope, just so you can get used to how, using a telescope, changing eyepieces, using the focus and things like that, they're a great little telescope and they cost peanuts really in uh, telescope prices. So I know I'm contradicting myself a little bit when we, we, we talked about aperture before saying a minimum four inch, well I'm now dropping an inch and that's purely because there is a place for these little tiny refractors, uh, reflectors, you know, um, because they're not totally useless. They're certainly not as useless as I first, you know, when I first saw them, I thought, why, why are they doing that? You know, it just didn't make no sense until I actually looked through one. Now, there is another downside to these tabletop re, uh, reflecting telescopes or even uh, tabletop uh, tripods in general mounts. You've got to remember, no matter how good the optics are in whatever telescope you've got, if you've got a wobbly mount or support that the mount's on, it's going to be a nightmare. You're going to quickly find out, as a new telescope uh, owner, how much things wobble in there, all right? You've only just got to touch the telescope and this, the image is going to be like this, wobbling all over the place. So think about where you, if you're going to buy one of these tabletop telescopes, think about where you're going to put it. Now, it's all right saying, well, I'll just put it on our table outside. You know, we've got a nice big table. Well, think about that for a minute, all right? Re you remember, you're going to have to put it right on a corner of a table, all right? And you're only going to have this much of the sky to look at, all right? Anything behind you, you're going to have to take it up and obviously move it to the other side of the table. So just bear these things in mind. One of the best things I've seen used for these uh, tabletop mounts as they like to call them is a stool like a bar stool with a uh, no cushions obviously on the top uh, any sponge just a, a normal wooden top uh, they're great all right you know you, you can still move around them and it's lovely and stable some of them do come with a an attachment that you can fit onto a decent tripod uh, like a camera uh, 
tripod so there's another option but if you are going to buy these uh, tabletop uh, telescopes there's nothing wrong with them they're great little starter telescopes but just think carefully about where you're going well what you're going to put it on because that's important now I'll just uh, quickly tell you which telescope is going to be better for each uh, category of astronomy okay on these small apertures if you like now if it's the moon and planets, all right, that you, that's all you're interested in seeing, all right, I can't recommend a refractor anymore, all right, refractors are great for the moon and the planets. For deep sky, moon and the planets, okay, as uh, we'll put it all in. Now, what I mean by deep sky is these are targets that are a lot fainter. They're not as obvious as like the stars or um, a planet, which looks like a small star in the sky. You're going to have to use optical age and do some proper searching for these deep sky um, targets. Now, for uh, those kind of targets, you want something like a reflector telescope. Um, you can use refractors for deep sky, but again, you're going to need the aperture. And remember, in refractors, aperture means a lot of money, all right? So this is why these are great for bang for buck, all right? Uh, I'll keep going back to that word, but it's so true. Okay, so these are great for both planets, the moon, and a bit of deep sky. Now, on an aperture such as four or five inches, you're not going to see all the deep sky targets, okay? It's just not enough light coming in there. You are going to need a little bit more aperture. Uh, but like I say, don't let that put you off. There's still a, a plenty of things to see with sizes this, uh, this big, okay? Now for Cassegrains, again, a 90 millimeter uh, Smith Cassegrain or Maksutov um, telescope is gonna, the moon and the planets are going to look unbelievable, okay? In fact, some of the best views I've ever had of a planet was through uh, a Maksutov, okay? So uh, they're, they're great for that. Again, are they any good for deep sky? Well, we need to start putting the aperture up and like refractors, this is where the price can start to climb. All right. Um, and not only the price, but the weight. These things can get heavy, all right? I mean, just the eight inch version, I mean, it's, it's a pretty weight. And I've uh, heard that the 15, the 15 inch in uh, the, uh, the Cassegrain or Schmidt Cassegrain range is just, uh, you know, you, you, you need to be like strength of 10 men to lift one of those things. But this is to, t uh, you need to bear this in mind with any telescope that you can buy. It's all right saying to yourself, well, you know, I've got a thousand pound, I'm gonna spend a thousand pound on the biggest telescope I can buy. Well, think about things like storage. How often are you gonna use it? Remember, you're, never, you're not gonna use it um, uh, 365 days of the week, because it's just cloudy. And that's another thing that you're gonna find out, just how many cloudy nights we get. No matter where you live in the world, you'll just realize how bad the weather is all of a sudden. Um, so, you know, think about how often you are actually gonna use it. Are you gonna be just taking it out occasionally, you know, then, you know, something like a little refractor like this, or even like a tabletop Dobsonian is gonna do you just fine. If you wanna do a little bit more serious, a bit of deep sky work, a bit of planetary work, a five inch reflector, some Something like that or a little bit bigger if you can get if you can afford it always go for that little bit bigger all right well there you go guys i hope that's cleared a few things up for you when you do actually make that decision of buying your first telescope don't forget any questions that you may have or think i might have missed something just leave them down in the comments and uh, i always read the comments and i always try my best to answer every single comment i don't by the way i don't always get Get notifications if I do answer you then you answer me back for some reason I don't get notifications but I have now found a new feature on the YouTube studio side of things where I can see unread comments I didn't know that were there I tell you all this YouTube thing is is pretty new to me so I I'm still learning I will get better trust me folks but like I say if you have got any questions just leave them down in the comments below and uh, while you're there if you haven't subscribed maybe hit that subscribe button Press the like because that, honestly, that, that helps the channel more than anything. 
and uh, and while we're on subscribers thank you so much once again guys for the 1000 uh, plus subscribers now i hit the 1000 uh, a couple of days ago and it has totally blown me away um i really can't believe the channel's grown so quick and it's all down to you amazing people so thank you so much each and every one of you well until the next one happy telescope hunting and i will see you on the next one bye for now